Howdy, it's Kyle talking about natural disasters. In your previous life, I did natural hazard mitigation and preparedness planning, so this is a topic that's really important to me. And one of my first videos that I posted a few years back was about natural disasters in the U.S. more in a general sense. But that video is about three years old now, so I wanted to do a little update to it. This one's more about which parts of the country see the most disasters, which ones see the fewest, and why you get certain hazards in one part of the country, not the next. This graph shows the total number of disasters in the U.S. by type, and these are federally declared disasters. The list is broken down a little bit differently than you might expect. Convective storm is severe thunderstorms, including tornadoes, as well as blizzards and massive winter storms. And you'll see at second and fourth are floods, with most of the unspecified floods, in fact, being river and flooding. And river and floods is a number one concern in terms of overall natural hazards in the U.S. The major part of the country where you're going to see the massive river and flooding is going to be the flatter parts of the Midwest, especially the Great Plains area. I'll show this map multiple times during this video, but for this category of river and flooding, check out the blue areas, mostly in the upper Midwest. And the darkest blue you're going to see is along the Red River. This is the river that is the boundary between North Dakota and Minnesota. And you'll also see lots of dark blue in eastern South Dakota, southern Minnesota, different parts of Iowa and Illinois. And these are mostly flatter type areas that are affected by massive river systems. And it isn't necessarily the biggest rivers that create the biggest floods. You can certainly see the Mississippi River boundary there with Iowa and Illinois. And the Missouri River boundary there between Nebraska and Iowa. But again, it's the Red River along the North Dakota-Minnesota border and the Cedar River going across Iowa that can often cause the biggest problems. And about once a decade or so, the Midwest sees an overall regional massive flood, with the most recent one being in 2019. Many states were affected. Iowa and Nebraska probably got it the worst, but Missouri, Illinois, North and South Dakota both got it pretty bad as well. In 2008, there was another region-wide massive flood throughout the Midwest with Iowa, Illinois, Kansas, Indiana, and Wisconsin receiving the worst of it. And there were also massive floods throughout the Midwest in 1993, with almost every state in the Midwest being affected to some degree. And when a flood hits, it causes more damage than most other disasters because everything in a flood's way gets destroyed. And it might only take two or three feet of water in your house to total it, and if it's a mobile home, maybe only one foot. And about the only time you'll see major media coverage of big floods is when it's so bad that you can see water overtopping houses or just see the, the roofs of houses, then it's more sensational so you can show more of it. But you do get massive floods throughout the Midwest all the time, but it doesn't always get the, the media attention they deserve. But it certainly isn't just the Midwest where you can see these massive river and floods. There are many other river systems in the country that we see a lot of flooding. So you think about the Ohio River going through Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. You don't have to go very far from the river before you start seeing some hills and even mountains. So as a result, the floodplain isn't as wide. You're not going to see as much widespread flooding as you are in the flatter parts in the Midwest. However, during heavy rains, you can get a lot more flash flooding in some of these mountainous areas as the heavy rain causes the rain to be funneled into these haulers and ravines, which causes much more swiftly moving water that can be very dangerous for people living in these areas. But in terms of overall widespread damage, it's not going to be as much. And ultimately, anywhere you live, any creek, stream, or river can flood. Obviously, some flood less than others. Some are controlled by dams and levees. Some are controlled by sketchy dams and levees. But if you live somewhere, a creek, river, or stream, yeah, it can flood. The next hazard I'm going to talk about show up is tropical cyclone on this list. This includes hurricanes and tropical storms. Hurricanes need warm water for strength, so the parts of the country where you see the warmest water is where you can have the most hurricanes. And Florida is certainly the first state you're going to think of when you think of hurricanes, but they can happen all throughout the Gulf Coast and anywhere along the Atlantic Coast as well. But not all parts along the coast are going to see the same level of hurricane vulnerability. You can see a lot more strikes in South Florida and along the Gulf Coast between Texas and Alabama, but there are significantly fewer landfalls in the northeastern Gulf of Mexico as well as the Georgia and North Florida coasts. This map shows the recurrence interval for major hurricanes making landfall, and you'll see many more in North Carolina than either South Carolina, Georgia, or even North Florida. And this map shows exactly why. When a hurricane turns and starts going up the East Coast, North Carolina is kind of sticking out there, so it's much more difficult for a hurricane to miss the state. With the northern coast of Florida, as well as the Georgia coast being much more tucked in, you're going to get far fewer hurricanes making landfall there. But it certainly can happen. This is the track for Hurricane Matthew in 2016. And this heavily affected Savannah, Georgia, which normally isn't at a huge risk for most hurricanes. But nonetheless, they got to be ready for it. 
And it's the same type of thing along the Gulf Coast, where not everywhere along the coast faces the same vulnerability. But hurricanes need warm water, so as you go farther up the coast, you're going to see a much fewer number of hurricanes making landfall there. However, it is still possible, and it is reasonable that a Category 2 hurricane could make landfall in New Jersey or Long Island, and sea surface temperatures are exactly why you do not get hurricanes off the west coast in the U.S. If you've ever been to the California coast and dipped your toe in the ocean, you notice how cold the water is, as opposed to dipping your toe into the Gulf of Mexico where it feels almost like spa water. And it doesn't have to be a major hurricane to do major flood damage. Tropical Storm Allison in 2001 did major flood damage to the Houston area. So even though it was quote-unquote only a tropical storm, it still did massive damage. Next, I'm going to talk about tornadoes and other severe thunderstorm wind damage. And whereas hurricanes are the largest storms on Earth and how much space they take up, tornadoes are the strongest storms on Earth in terms of its overall wind speeds. Wind speeds of over 200 miles an hour are common for a tornado, and up to 300 miles an hour are possible. And most well-built structures will withstand the winds of a hurricane, but very few are going to withstand the winds from a tornado. And often when you see damage from the worst tornadoes, it often looks more apocalyptic than other types of disasters, but fortunately it does usually only cover a very small area as opposed to massive widespread damage on an area standpoint like you might see with floods or hurricanes. Tornadoes are a little more widespread than other disasters that can technically happen in all 50 states, although the geographic distribution is by no means even. The Central Great Plains are known for being the part of the country that sees the most tornadoes, with Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska seeing the most, although Florida is always right there with those four as well. This map shows all the known tornado tracks of the past 70 years, and look at that black hole there in West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky. What's going on there? Hurricanes need warm water for strength. Tornadoes need big differences in temperature and pressure for strength. So what happens normally is why you get so many tornadoes in this part of the country is you have these cold air masses from up here. Really cold air masses hold less moisture. These are really dry. So cold, dry air masses here, warm, humid air masses here. So you get these two coming in here, start to mix up here. And this is where you get the most instability for the atmosphere. You get these two very different air masses colliding. And so if you've been in an area where there's been a tornado nearby, you might be standing outside and it's kind of cold and dry, or real windy. A couple of minutes later, it's warm and humid, and it goes back to being cold and dry, it kind of goes back and forth. And that's a pretty good sign the air is unstable and something bad might happen. So the analogy I use is kind of like how you've got these mixing here. you got the, the beer, the liquor, here's the club, you're dancing. It's all mixing up in there, but it gets really unstable. Tornado. And the tornado is kind of like the atmosphere throwing up, so that's just kind of the analogy I like to use. It just gets so unstable, it can't take anymore. But why do you have this black hole over here in tornadoes? Well, when these two collide, the head-on collision forces the air to rise. So when the air is forced to rise, that's when it can cool, condense, and that's where you can get the, the big storms, you know, the taller clouds. But over here, it's mountainous. So what happens is the air mass is coming from here, but the mountains here are forcing it to rise. So it's not the head-on collision of two air masses. The terrain is causing the air mass to rise, so it's able to dissipate its energy through rain and thunderstorms. You can certainly get rain and thunderstorms. You get tons of rain in West Virginia, but you're not going to get storms so strong that it's that the pressure differences are so much where you're going to get so much instability to where you get tornadoes. So that's why you get that black hole in the Appalachian region here of tornadoes. Get a lot more here, flatter. They can mix. But the time of year where you see the most tornadoes is not distributed evenly either. In spring, you're going to see the most number of tornadoes in the south and the southern parts of the plains. It can still be pretty cold in April in the upper Midwest. But by July, you can see it's definitely shifted towards the upper Midwest. You see very few tornadoes in the southeast in July because there really isn't much cold front action going on in the south in the summer. And then by December, it's so cold up north, you're really only seeing tornadoes in the southeast and a couple in California even. In terms of the northeast, it can sometimes get even too cold or too snowy for them. Whether it be massive blizzards, nor'easters, or those really cold winter coastal storms, even the part of the country that's most used to these types of temperatures and conditions can even get overwhelmed sometimes. And although there have been some massive blizzards and nor'easters and major winter superstorms, they tend to not do as much damage as major hurricanes or major tornado outbreaks, and nowhere near as much damage as major river and floods. So in terms of meteorological hazards in the eastern U.S., New England is the safest part of the country. 
And that's why when you look at a map like this, the northeast is lightly shaded for five of the six major disasters shown here. And even though you can get floods and blizzards out west, it's going to be the fires and the geologic hazards that get you out there. So this map shows the wildfire activity by county. So obviously a huge correlation here between the part of the country that's much drier and the part of the country that has the most wildfires. I prefer a dry heat and I hate humidity, but this is a big downside of it. Because the counties in the west are so large, it can often be hard to get an accurate depiction of where the, the worst part of that county is for that certain hazard. But generally speaking, certainly the more wooded the area is and the more sloped the terrain would be to funnel winds, the more risk you're going to be for a wildfire. And the combination of climate change and more and more people moving to wooded areas in the west means that the overall wildfire risk and vulnerability is higher out there than it used to be. At any one time, primarily in the summer or fall, there are going to be a bunch of wildfires going on throughout the western U.S. Some will be small, but undoubtedly several will be really large. And just like a tornado, you can get a wildfire to occur really anywhere, but you're going to be at much more risk in rural, heavily wooded areas and dry parts of the country. So if you live in a heavily wooded part of the eastern U.S., just know that in drought conditions, your wildfire hazard can be pretty high as well. It won't be as high as the western U.S., but it can still be significant. Other major concerns for hazards in the western U.S. are largely geological. This map shows the likelihood for a major earthquake to occur in the next hundred years. So you'll see most of California, much of Nevada, and the northwestern portion of Washington to be highlighted in deep red. The coastal and mountainous portions of California are at the highest risk, but a lot of the high-risk areas are very lightly populated or open desert. If you've ever driven Interstate 5 from L.A. to San Francisco, it's one of the most boring drives in the country, but it goes through basically the San Andreas Fault Zone where you see basically no development. At some point, there's going to be the quote-unquote big one, so who knows where it's going to happen, but if it happens in the Los Angeles metro area or the San Francisco Bay area, it's always going to do way more damage than if it occurred out in the middle of nowhere halfway between the two. Although it is worth noting that San Diego has a much lower earthquake risk than other parts of California, just one more reason why San Diego is so great. You see far fewer number of earthquakes in Oregon, but it is possible to have the quote-unquote big one up there as well with the Cascadia subduction zone just off coast. That area you see in the central part of the U.S., southeastern Missouri, northwestern Tennessee, west Kentucky, this is the new Madrid fault zone. This is where there was a massive earthquake in the 19th century, larger than any of the earthquakes observed in the western contiguous U.S., You'll see another little hot spot there in South Carolina centered around Charleston. It's less likely that one will occur there, but if a major one does happen, it will do far more damage there than if it happened in the west. A byproduct of major earthquakes that occur offshore might be a tsunami. Major tsunami occur very rarely and they mainly affect Alaska and Hawaii. There have been major tsunamis that have done damage on the big island, especially near Hilo, as well as many coastal towns in Alaska. A tsunami results from a major earthquake happening offshore, so imagine dropping a rock in the bathtub. The resulting shock wave would be the wave, the tsunami, that would come onshore. So you might see some fake photos around the internet that look kind of like this, or this, but this is not what a tsunami would look like if it were about to hit your city. It would be more like a large wall of water, almost like a giant storm surge of a hurricane. Outside of Alaska and Hawaii, there are very few parts of the U.S. where you're at a really high risk of tsunami with a couple of coastal towns in Oregon, Washington, and California being the ones that are at the highest risk. I actually wrote the Tsunami Preparedness and Response Plan for Monterey County in California. I put these signs up all over the county. Uh, it's pretty cool, although the overall tsunami risk is low there. I use that plan as a reason to really do more floodplain mapping and response because the areas that would have been most affected by the tsunami would have been the same areas affected by just an overall coastal or river and flood. A tsunami is a really scary hazard to think of, but the vast majority of Americans don't have anything to worry about really when it comes to this one. And to save the most powerful disaster for last, the one that has the highest damage ceiling of them all, and that's a volcanic eruption. No other natural hazard can do as much widespread damage as a massive volcanic eruption. So here's a list of the number of active volcanoes per state, and these are entirely exclusive to the western U.S. The last time there was a major volcanic eruption in the contiguous U.S. was 1980, Mount St. Helens in western Washington. From a purely geologic standpoint, this wasn't a huge eruption, and Mount St. Helens is not one of the most damaging volcanoes on Earth. However, it did a ton of damage, mainly in asphalt downwind of the volcano. You're going to get worse effects from a volcanic eruption a thousand miles downwind of it than if you were 200 miles upwind of it. So check out these photos here. This is volcanic ash, not snow. 
but it's also worth pointing out that there are different types of volcanoes and they don't all do the same types of damage. So you've probably seen photos and video of people getting up really close to those volcanoes in Hawaii. These are called shield volcanoes and these are the largest volcanoes on Earth. However, they have the least violent eruptions. The ones that can do the most damage are called composite cones. These have much more explosive eruptions. So this is one that's not going to happen very often, but when it does, it can be bad. And if it's really bad, it's really bad. And that one you see looks kind of like a red hashtag next to Yellowstone. Yeah, don't worry about that one. So those are the main natural hazards I wanted to go over for the U.S. This map shows the overall disaster recurrence period in years for each county. And with the majority of natural hazards in the U.S. being tied to meteorology, the safest parts of the country for most disasters are going to be in the desert, drier parts of the country. In these areas that are shaded lightly, you don't have massive, severe thunderstorms or tornadoes, no hurricanes, no major river floodplains. And once you get away from the west coast, there really isn't a huge earthquake hazard for most places, which means the only real concern for that part of the country is going to be the wildfires. And if you're out in the middle of the desert where there's not even trees, you don't even have much of a risk for wildfire. So if you live in an area that isn't completely wooded, or if you have a lot of defensible space around your property, or if you're in an urban area, you really don't have much of a risk in terms of natural disasters in the interior west. Looking at this map, I'm not sure what's going on in Georgia and South Carolina. That looks more almost like state data reporting because the numbers fall way too cleanly state lines. So a general rule of thumb is if you're really close to a major body of water, you're going to be at more risk for a natural disaster. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve and subscribe to this channel if you're interested in learning more about U.S. geography. I'm talking about physical geography, stuff like this. I'm comparing and contrasting cities and states in all kinds of different categories, ranking them and things, and talking about cross-country road tripping. And everything I talk about comes from a little more nerdy type perspective. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out.